11 hours back and forth about the death penalty and all of the misconceptions and all of this stuff, and we sat there 11 hours. And we finished, I believe it was like 4 in the morning, but at 4 in the morning, we won. And so what we did this year was we went from you have absolutely no chance to getting the largest legislative victory ever in the House and to pass in the Senate where almost anybody would tell you it couldn't happen. And so now everybody that's on this train or should have been on this train is really on the train. You know, like we've got to go talk to the governor, we've got to do blah, blah, blah. So I'm thinking, the governor said she doesn't like this thing. She's going to veto this thing. So that's when we had this plan. We're going to get the media. We're going to, you're not going to not be able to hear about the death penalty in the state of Connecticut. That's pretty much what we did. We started talking constantly, getting people uh, to come listen to us. We brought in victims' families. There was pressure on the governor. We called the church. Hey, she goes to the church, put pressure constantly, constantly, constantly. So then the governor, then somebody called me. You don't talk to first year people. It's like, you know, nobody talks to us. We can go sit in the corner and, you know, sit in the dark until you're 50 or something like that. Yeah. So I'm like, wow, they called me. What do they want? Governor wants to meet with you. <laughs> Never happens, right? So I'm like, wow, we must be doing our job. So I go in and meet with the governor. I'm thinking, the governor's not telling me why. You don't understand. That's not what happens. The governor agrees with me on every point. And I'm thinking, Oh, wow, we really got something now, right? They kind of agree on every single point. Then, just because she starts talking about veto again, which doesn't make sense if you think about what she's just been saying to me in private, we said, well, we gotta do something big. I get a call from Ben Jones, head of the NAACP, right? I'm like, oh, Ben Jones calling me? Nobody knows me, right? <laughs> but Ben Jones calling me and says, I wanna come to Connecticut and we wanna talk about the death penalty. So Ben gets here the day that she's going to veto or not veto the bill. And he calls her, oh, I want to meet with you before you do it. Well, just as she's calling her, she vetoes it anyway, knowing, knowing that he wanted to talk to her. She could have vetoed it right after, but she vetoes the bill anyway. And I, I wasn't really disappointed so much that she vetoed the bill, because I kind of expected it. But what disappointed me about it was what she said when she vetoed the bill. Because one of the discussions we have when we talk about the death penalty, and there are many other many things that I'm going to, but one of the things we talk about is the racial disparity is prevalent. And she said in her veto message that she understands that people have concern about that racial disparity, but it's fine with her. And that she doesn't see a need to fix it. Now, that blew my mind. Because even if you are a proponent of doing the death penalty, you should want to fix that portion. And for a governor to look at it, the people in the state, because whether she recognizes this or not, people who are brown, black, not like her, are her constituents. And for her to look at those people and say, well, you know, I understand that you might be caught up in this in a way that other people might not. And I understand that it's not fair, apparently. But that's fine with me. That's problematic. And so for me, from that moment on, it wasn't just about that. It said to me, because I, I don't really get involved in other people's races except for a particular race, which just happened. But I don't generally get involved in other people's races. But that said to me, she's got to go. Because she doesn't represent all of the people in the state. And a group of people, including myself, because if you look at me, you know what I am, don't count to the point of death. That's a problem. So where we are right now is we're in a place, we're in a good place. We're in a place where we know we can get the bill passed. There's, there's a bunch of states that don't know that. What we need is a government who's different. We need a government who understands that people's lives matter. We need a government who understands that the cost of the death penalty makes no sense. If you look at the estimates, it's four to seven million dollars in Connecticut a year that you spend on the death penalty. Yet, we've only put one person to death since 1976 when, we, when the law changed. So that you could have a death penalty. Because in 72, there was the uh, uh, Furman versus Georgia case where uh, the the uh, death penalty in the United States was effectively outlawed because of the way that the death penalty scheme worked. And then in 1976, there was a great case which allowed for it, but you had to have certain caveats, right? So this is this is, but this gets you into why the death penalty doesn't work. So even with the 1976 case, most of, most states wrote these laws where death penalty really doesn't apply to murder as a general case, right? Where does death penalty apply to murder as a general case? So in Connecticut. 
There are eight different steps you have to go to, like you have to kidnap the person to murder them, or you have to murder more than one person, or it has to be an officer in the line of duty. Right? There are all these special circumstances. But when we talk about the death penalty, what we talk about is murder is wrong, and so therefore you should get the death penalty. Except that that's not really true. If you fit one of these special cases, you'll get the death penalty. Maybe. Not necessarily, because you have the guy who was executed, the only one, in one jurisdiction, he doesn't get the death penalty. In another jurisdiction, he did. So the death penalty doesn't apply when it should. And if you look at the 1976 case, what it said was, whenever the death penalty should apply, it must apply. And so if we're talking about doing the death penalty, I said to the people who want the death penalty, I challenge you to always do the death penalty. Let's not pick and choose. Always. And forget, forget those restrictions. Why don't we go and say, well, anybody that murders would put the death penalty. And you know why they don't want to do that? Because that's not really what they want to do. They want a tool so they can say, we're tough on her. But they use human lives to do that. And that's not right. And I'll tell you something. The community I represent, it goes over into almost the East Rock section, where there are nice big homes and people live a completely different life. But then it comes back down in the new home of the Dick's one. And you can murder everybody that you want there, but you won't get the death penalty. And so it's my job to represent those people. And if those people don't rank, don't equate to the death penalty, then nobody does. And it's not just my job, because they are my constituents. But I'm a constituent of the government. And they're constituents of the government. And they must rank for it. So all of us in that room, no matter what our personal feelings are, have to deal with the facts. And if we're dealing with the facts, we have to all say the death penalty doesn't work, and therefore we must do one of two things, either abolish it or fix it. But we can't sit on our hands and say, I prefer not to. There's a story about a guy who said, I prefer not to. It's part of the experiment, right? That's what I call the government now, because that's her refrain for everything. I prefer not to. Hey, government, we have a, a budget bill. Would you do something about it, veto it, sign it, something? I prefer not to. Hey, we got a death penalty. I prefer not to deal with the facts. This is a problem. And so what I need is I need people to understand that I'm a voice. I think I'm a voice that's now recognized. But we need more people involved. The more people we get involved, the more people that ask questions, that get to understand what's going on with the death penalty, not just in Connecticut, but in the United States. In the Western world, we're an anomaly. Everybody else is recognized. Hey, we discovered fire. The United States has it. We need to do something about where we are. And what we need to do is we need to get rid of the death penalty because you can't fix it. You can't. We ask the people on the other side, what would you do to fix it? They had nothing. You know why? Because there is no fix for it. Because you can't do what they want to do. You can't. And they'll say, well, you know, going back a long time, back in the biblical times, there was an eye for an eye. Well, I have an answer for that. Read the damn Bible. <laughs> Pay attention to it. Ask a biblical scholar what the eye for an eye was. You know, during that time, an eye for an eye, as with most of the laws, had to apply a university. Most people don't know. They don't study the Bible. They don't study, study uh, the Torah. They don't study these things. They just pick a phrase out and say, this is what it says. Had to apply universally. And this is, so it couldn't apply to everybody. So, it sounds funny, but actually, if you ask a scholar, they'll tell you. Some people don't have eyes, so it couldn't apply universally. What the eye for an eye report was about was about money, not about you poke out my eye, I poke out your eye. But people don't care. I for an eye, it works, it makes my argument sound good, great, right? So that argument makes absolutely no sense. And then when Jesus comes along, right, people say, well, Jesus kind of uh, goes against the, the Old Testament. Actually, if you understand what the Old Testament is about, no, he doesn't, right? He tells you to turn to the chief, which just further tells you that this line of thinking is not what you're saying, but that doesn't matter. But that's what this whole death penalty argument is about. The death penalty argument is about we don't care about facts. And I'm going to tell you something. In, in the, the first committee meeting that I talked about, one of the senators leaned over to me and said, I'm impressed by your argument. It's absolutely brilliant. I'm thinking, great. I said, so you're going to vote with it? He said, no way, no one can vote with you. My 